Awesome. Thanks very much. Um, so just to wake everyone up from the sort of glucose slump post-lunch, uh, I can't make you dance around because I don't have the charisma of Rory. So to follow you know, the politicians who would do who don't have charisma, I'm going to give something away. So I'm going to bribe you into excitement. So our faithful minion has a Star Wars-related prize. And the loudest answer that's the closest will win this question. So if we are out in the Karoo in the nights, you know, deep of night, lying on the back, looking up at the heavens, how many stars can you see with the naked eye? Oh, that's a good quote. <laughs> good lateral thinking. Let's see who else we have. 40 million. At least 40, yeah, 40 yeah. Million. Plus, uh, 9, Ooh, someone who works for us is getting close. <laughs> right back, shout, shout. No. Okay. Right, 5,000 stars. So, who, who, who was closer than nine? Sean said nine. Anyone? What did you say? Paul, who ever said? No, I think the man there. It's the man with the hand. You with the hand up there. That guy. Okay, awesome. So there'll be a prize at the end for those who've been paying attention as well. So X-Wing is up for grabs after the Falcon. Not the same guy again. Anyway, my name is Simon Ratcliffe. I work for the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. We used to be called SKA South Africa, which was much cooler, but now we're some very tragic government institution. We don't do tragic government work, which is quite nice. Um, and we get clean audits and we spend your taxpayers' money wisely. But this is what we're building, and this is kind of like a talk of two halves, much like a football match. I'm going to talk a little bit about astronomy and why it's interesting and why it scales, uh, and then a little bit of technology, because it'd be boring just to talk about the stars all the time. But basically, what we all know and what's familiar to us is optical astronomy. So that's a fairly big optical instrument, a 2.2 meter diameter uh, optical facility. That's the kind of stuff that it can see. So that's a galaxy called Centaurus A. 100, 150 billion stars in the middle of that little thing there. A whole lot of dust and gas and stuff around it. It's pretty impressive. So the question is, is that everything? Is that all we need to know about it? And luckily for me as a radio astronomer, that isn't everything we need to know about it. If we look at it using a radio telescope, what we see is all this fake color stuff that we didn't know about before at all. So you think that galaxy is maybe 100,000 light years in diameter. So these huge jets coming out of it, real uh, matter that's being ejected from the inside of the, the black hole, essentially, in the middle of that galaxy, interacting with the media around it and giving off these radio emissions. So radio gives us a completely different picture on the universe. And I'll show you a lot more about why radio is important to us. If we take Centaurus A and go even further out, so you know, that's the zoom in of the optical bit. That's a little image we made ourselves a long time ago with a very small telescope. Those are, those two, those are the two lobes, basically, of those jets you saw before. Uh, if we see the full extent, that's on the right-hand side. So Centaurus A, in terms of the way it gives off emission and the way it interacts with our universe, if you were to be able to see it in the night sky, the full extent of it is eight degrees. Now, to give you context for that, the moon is half a degree. So imagine a moon 16 times. If we could see radio waves with our eyes, that's what we would see. So it gives you a little insight into why this is so interesting. The downside of radio astronomy is energy. So if you eat a chocolate bar, 1.2 megajoules, quite a bit. If you want to melt a snowflake, about a joule worth of energy required. That's how much energy we collect with a very large radio telescope in a whole day from sources outside our solar system. So less than a microjoule. And that gives you a hint as to why we need to build such big facilities. Because there's such a small amount of stuff coming at us. Everything else we do on Earth dominates what we would see from space. Any source of interference, people talking on cell phones, people driving around in petrol-driven cars, all of these things interfere relatively you know, to that small number. So that's why we have to build these things in, in remote places. And I'll show you what that looks like. But to address this, and this is scale conf, so you have to talk about scaling up and scaling out and things falling down and that kind of stuff. This is kind of the progression of, uh, of radio astronomy in the early, early days. You built a dish. It's a natural thing to do. It collects more photons, focuses them to a point where you can collect that, that information and do something with it. So you build them bigger, 9 meters, 76, 100 meters. 100 meters is about it. There are a couple of 100 meter class antennas. One of them just fell down uh, of its own accord uh, like 20 years ago. So, Building much bigger single antenna than 100 meters starts to get really expensive and really tricky. So in order to do better than just scaling up your single antenna, 
you do need to scale out. But for us, first, we had to do the baby step. Uh, and so July 2006, this was effectively our first light. So the first time we received a little bit of information, you know, this is the very base level. We looked for neutral hydrogen in our galaxy. Uh, the picture is quite nicely dated by the Livestrong bracelet. Uh, so it's a good cultural artifact to position this in 2006. Uh, the dress style as well is pretty uh, 2006 -y. But kind of that's where we, we began, and these were kind of very modest, uh, modest setting. A couple of years after that, uh, we built CAT7. Uh, so for those of you who recognize it, this is the Karoo region of the Northern Cape. Uh, probably nine hours drive from here, if you get in your, get in your bucky and drive there, if you can find where it is. Uh, in the early days, there was nowhere to get there. We had to build roads. We had to build our own power lines. We had to build our own fiber. Uh, it was really totally in the middle of nowhere, but chosen on purpose, because that's where we go. Uh, to get away from all these sources of interference that can affect us. So 2009, we built this. That's what we wanted to build. So we built CAT7 as a precursor to building a much bigger facility. So CAT7 was the Karoo Array Telescope. It was very imaginatively named. And then we decided to build a much bigger one, 64 antennas, that we called Meerkat. I see my fonts have gone completely screwy. Should have used my own laptop. Anyway, you'll have to imagine what's, what's happening. Um, so that's what we thought Meerkat would look like. This is in 2011. And that's what we built seven years later. Meerkat was inaugurated in July this year. 64 antennas, the most powerful radio telescope in the world. And uh, we've been running it and doing science on it uh, now for yeah, six, nine months. And I'll show you a little bit of that at early science. Just to give you a little feel for what it looks like if you head out there. So those, those antennas stand 17 meters high, uh, from you know, the base to tip, essentially. If you can stand up in front of one of them, it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, and imagine when we started here, there was nothing. It all looked like this. And now you have these kind of alien forms sprouting out of the desert all over the show. All of them connected, so all of them have uh, uh, digitizers at the feed, so we digitize our signal there. Uh, and send it back, so each of these have got uh, 40 gigabit links back to our, our central location, and I'll show you some more diagrams about, uh, about how that works. But it's all the process of building on top of what we've done before, and kind of, I call this the first born, so this is the first little blobby we saw uh, with the first four antennas of Meerkat, because it was a different design to Cat7, so we built Cat7 and figured it out a little bit, and then we threw it away, basically, and uh, that's what we got from our our first four antennas. We were like, yes, it's a blob. And everyone who's not a radio astronomer is like, you guys are the worst nerds ever. Um, but we built more antennas. And 16 antennas, suddenly, aha, triplets. So what we thought was just a blob is not a blob. It's actually three blobs. It's just triple the excitement. <laughs> 32 antennas, then it's when, that's when it starts to get, uh, get really interesting. So now you can tell it's not just three blobs. It's what we saw earlier a little bit. There's some sort of active galactic nuclei on there. Nothing working. Oh. Is that working? Ah, excellent. OK, let me just have a drink. I don't know what's going on with my voice. Right, okay, so back to this. So now you can see that there's actually something interesting happening here. There's this galactic nuclei, and there's probably jets coming out of there, as we saw earlier, and these big blobs of, uh, of emission. So great, we learn a whole lot about it. 64 antennas, we really start to see morphology. We see how it interacts with things. We can do real science on this. And uh, that whole structure there is about a million light years long. Um, so. You know, it's a tiny, it was a tiny little blob. That's all we knew about it. Now we know a whole lot about it. So part of what we, we needed to do was to figure out, we built this big complicated instrument, and a big part of radio astronomy is understanding why and how it's broken, because it's always broken. It's got so many moving parts. There's always something that's busted. And uh, that's the process of effectively of calibration, of understanding what are all the effects that are breaking what you would like to have. So we designed this perfect, beautiful instrument, but we built it and it's quite crappy. It's not really crappy, but you know, relatively speaking, uh, compared to the signals you're looking at, it is. So we found a patch of the sky which we thought, right, this is the, the quietest neighborhood we can find. Nothing is happening here. 
This was a, an image showing what was known before of this Patras guy. Again, it's about a degree, so you know, if you hold up your sort of thumb, that's half a degree. It's a tiny little patch of sky. And when we looked at it, we could see you know, eight or 10 different sources in this. So we thought, right, this is a good place to go and have a look, and uh, we can do our calibration on this. We spent 12 hours worth of uh, time staring at this with our big instrument, and it wasn't quite as quiet as we thought it would be. So previously, we had known about 10 or 12 of these, this has got nearly 5,000 galaxies in it. So every little spot in there is a galaxy, each one with 100 billion plus stars. Uh, so there's quite a lot of stuff out there. And you can see some of them are close and look quite funky and have got structure. Some of them are very far away. You know, this is kind of a, a volumetric snapshot compressed into, into 2D. But uh, when you know, this comes out, came out of the instrument, it was, uh, there were some, uh, some tears around the office because it was 14, 15 years to get to this point of... Uh, seeing something completely new. A little bit of a uh, technical digression here. So it's very well to have a pretty picture, and the pretty picture is what we need to make to send out to uh, the media and to our, you know, our partners and that kind of thing. But really what we want to know is, is it any good? And so one of the things we do is astrometry, which is comparing the positions that we find in a field to things we've seen in other wavelengths, typically. So what we've done here is we've cross-identified the things we saw with what optical telescopes have seen. And that's a way to understand, you know, if we say this thing is actually over there and, it's this, and this is how bright it is, are we lying? Can someone actually, you know, verify what's happening? And what's interesting here is that our, our average error is about 0.1 arc second. So, you know, we 0.1 arc seconds off where someone else thought it was. They might be wrong, we might be wrong, who knows? But to give you a feeling, if you take a two-round coin and go and stand 25 kilometers away, 2.5 kilometers away, sorry, 25 would be the 0.1 arc second. That the angle that that coin subtends, that's an arc second. So it's a really, really small, tiny little error that we're seeing here, and you know, well within what we, what we were hoping for. So I showed you a picture of the Milky Way. I showed you this picture sort of earlier on with all these stars in our galaxy. And one of the interesting things about our galaxy is that we don't know much about what happens in the middle. And this is the problem with optical astronomy. Because there's so much dust and gas in a galaxy, a lot of what you would be able to see with your eyes is obscured. And so radio astronomy lets us probe into the middle of these galaxies and see what's actually happening. So the first thing we did scientifically with Meerkat in preparation for the big inauguration um, was to go and have a real look uh, at that galactic center. So you can see the Milky Way curving over as the Earth, the Earth spins. You can see a whole bunch of satellites going overhead. Um, and we sat and stared at the center of this galaxy for a long time. And what came out was this. So this is the middle of our galaxy. And uh, if you think of the dynamics that are going on here, right in the middle of this very bright patch there is Sagittarius A star, which is the, super, you know, the giant black hole at the center of our galaxy around which everything rotates and, and provides much of the sort of dynamics of how our galaxy works. But all the stuff we see around it, all these little wisps and, and bows and bubbles, so much of that had never been seen before. So it was really amazing to be able to unveil this thing as something that's really genuinely new and amazing. There's supernova remnants in here. There's magnetic field lines being twisted. There's a whole lot of really, really cool science. And if you, if you watch the scientific journals over the next couple of months, particularly Nature, there's a whole lot of stuff coming uh, based on this. So, radio astronomy. That was a quick, a quick digression and a quick tour around radio astronomy. Let's talk about a bit of tech and, and how how tech worked for us and worked against us, how we managed scale. Um, there's quite a bit in here about the various areas of challenge that we had. Uh, a lot of people have mentioned that the tools don't matter, and that's absolutely true. So there's a few mention of bits and pieces of tools, but you can substitute your, your flavor. Um, what, it's, what it's really about is the philosophy we took when trying to kind of tackle this big uh, monster that we had, to, we had to deliver. So the nice thing about radio astronomy is actually very simple. So, We've got someone to draw us a cartoon. This is how it works. You have uh, your incoming uh, photons from your distant source up there in the top right. Uh, those the yellow lines. Those get focused into a feed. The feed is basically just a piece of wire, very high tech. Uh, so you, you know, excite this uh, little piece of wire because of the <laughs> exciting things hitting it. And uh, you have a digitizer that sits behind that. And that takes that little tiny voltage, there's a little amplifier, amplifies it a bit, turns into a digital signal straight away. That's the blue line. So the blue line goes back to our, uh, our data center, our bunker. 
So this is all up in the Karoo on the same site. And uh, the data center we have is sort of a modest size. It can take 150 racks or so. But the difficulty of it being out there and really close to our instruments is there's no good getting so far away and then polluting your own backyard. And so that data center is built mostly underground. Uh, it's itself, it sits inside a completely copper-lined uh, shell. So our racks actually sit on polystyrene and then copper. And that was one of the challenges that actually led to one of the solutions that you'll see a little bit later on. Around that, the rebar is all galvanically connected, and it's this whole big complicated thing to make sure that we, when we run a computer in there, we can't actually see it from the radio telescope, which would defeat the thing. All these signals come back into that building, and then there's a process known as correlation. Correlation is really taking pairs of antennas and cross-multiplying those signals, looking for the phase difference between those signals. So we have 64 antennas, gives us like 3,000 baselines, which we calculate and accumulate and send on. And that's where you get the green transition. This is the science data processor. It's kind of the area I work in. That takes us raw data from the correlator. And eventually, bottom on the right-hand side there, you get an image on the screen. And everyone go, ooh, and ah. But there's a whole lot of tech to get there. Uh, just a note as well is that all the operation of the facility happened from Cape Town. That was the view from our old offices, which was really cool. Now the view from our new offices is like a, a train yard. Um, so. We'll keep that one because it looks a lot better. But basically, everything happens down here because we don't have too many people sitting up on site. And uh, if they want to live and have modern conveniences, those will all interfere with the telescope. So it's easier to just have all the stuff sitting down here. This is another view of what a radio telescope is for. And this is the view principally held by our funders. So the government is that it's a machine for making Nobel Prizes. That's the goal. You build this big facility and Nobel Prizes come out. What it really is... It's a machine for changing these very corrupted bits of data you get. So that top line effectively is saying, I could measure something from the sky, which is that VIJ, which would be a perfect measurement. But in measuring it, I have all these corrupting influences. I have the corruption of the fact that I have different amplifiers at different temperatures in every antenna. I have the intervening ionosphere around our Earth. I have the intervening uh, you know, interstellar medium between me and the source. I have temperatures, I have deformations from the dishes it moves, I have imperfections in the surface, I have noise introduced in all sorts of ways. So you have all these, these problems, so how you solve the problems is you have a magic box, you feed the magic box petabytes, petaflops, megawatts and gigadollars, and out pops your lovely thing. Our challenge, of course, is we don't have any megawatts at all, zero now, thanks, Eskom. We don't have any gigadollars much, we have megadollars, perhaps. So all of those are quite challenging. We do, unfortunately, still need the petabytes and petaflops, which does make it uh, a bit tricky, but that's kind of, in essence, what we're trying to do. So I mentioned we're, my group is called the Science Data Processor. That's our tiny little piece of the puzzle, just the bits that are highlighted. We just have a simple matter of receiving a little bit of data and storing it and showing people the images. So we do compute storage and mascots. I think the mascot is still in our domain of uh, expertise. But actually, there's quite a lot to it. And uh, I call this the unknown known challenge. So if you know about uh, you know, lunatic scientists, they talk about the known knowns, things that you know that you know. And then there are unknown knowns, things that you know that you don't know. And then there are unknown unknowns, things that you don't know that you don't know. So these, this is an example of a known unknown. We, didn't, we knew that we needed to know about how big our problem was, but we didn't know up front. So what we thought we were doing nine years ago was a lot less than this whole list. And so I say glibly that we had 6.7 engineers over nine years. That's what we averaged out to in terms of FTE complement in our group. This is what we ended up delivering. And fortunately, we knew that we would be underestimating our problem, which is why we spent a lot of time thinking about how we were going to address the scale challenges of it. But inevitably, you end up with a lot more than you thought you would, you would have. And uh, that prob number probably should go up a bit. So to digress to 2009, and you can tell from the grungy slide and, and the very like pot boiler psychology horrible philosophy statements I made back then, you know, this was a 20 year old writing this slide clearly. But of all that rubbish, the thing that's amazingly good was optimize last. There's one thing to take away, one thing we did really, really well was optimize last. And we stuck to this quite zealously. We always, always, always said, let's just use a simple thing that's to hand, and if it doesn't work, and if it's not good enough, at the end, we'll fix it. And Optimize Last has really helped us. 
Um, some of the other stuff is good, you know, perfection is an illusion, is obviously true. Uh, delivering what is needed, I mean, that means nothing. I mean, everyone does that. But Optimize Last also goes along with David Beasley's great quote, which is <laughs> the second most important thing to, to take away from this. Definitely don't write C++. So we wrote Python almost exclusively. We wrote some when we needed to. But that was, again, a, another part of this Optimize Last philosophy that we took. So putting into pictures what we actually ended up delivering, there's a whole lot of stuff there, and you don't need to go through it in, in any, any detail. This is kind of showing the flow of data that we get uh, from the correlator. So the correlator sits in the top uh, left hand there, labeled X engine. We have uh, 16 40 gig links uh, that come into us from, uh, from the correlator. We have an ingest phase where we take that high speed data and we do some kind of initial triage to it. Particularly there, the thing that takes a bit of, a bit of effort is looking for sources of interference. So I mentioned we try to get away from all these man-made problems. The big problem is what they do is they show up as artifacts in our data. And by doing our radio frequency interference detection as early as possible, while we still have high data rates and we haven't averaged the data and massaged it too much, that's the most effective way to get it out. So we do a lot of flagging up front. Then the data basically tees off in three directions. Uh, it goes to a calibration phase where we go and, as I say, try and fix these weird effects that have happened. It goes into an imaging node, which we'll talk a little bit about the thing that actually makes the cool pictures. And of course, it needs to get stored. Um, so it goes into this WAN buffer we have. That's because our link is, uh, I think we're on some sort of weird, like, bronze or pewter level service with our fiber link uh, from the crew, and we get, I don't know, we're lucky if we get a number starting with a nine in terms of the reliability on that. So we have to do quite a lot of work to make sure that our data actually ends up in the Cape, which is uh, down in the bottom right there, and I'll talk a little bit about storage later. So if we go through some of our, you know, what I, I've got a whole bunch of slides that are sort of scale and then something on the following the, the scale conf theme. So one of our first scale problems was compute. If you look at the numbers here, it depends where you're from. If you're an amazon -y person, you're like, oh, those are so small. Um, if you're like a South African startup, you're like, oh, there's quite a lot of stuff there to build. Um, the main challenge that we had with these numbers and delivering these numbers was money. So that's really what it boiled down to. We did the budgeting for this in 2008, and we bought the stuff in 2013. And the US dollar to the rand was exactly half by that stage. So everything you thought you knew was wrong. Um, but in the end, it ends up to, to being a fair bit of stuff that we had to do. Particularly the storage side was, was quite a challenge to get in in terms of what we wanted to do in terms of cost, but also performance. Um, as all of you know, the vendor white sheet tells you one thing, but if you actually use it in practice, everything is quite different. So part of the scale that, that's, a, that's problematic with this kind of a project is changing requirements. Because it's a long project, because it took us 15 years, what we thought we were doing in the beginning changed over time. And so this slide is really just about saying one of the design decisions that we took was to say, let's use multicast everywhere, and let's use the same data protocol everywhere. So we use a protocol called Speed, which we invented because, of course, you need another standard. But the reason we invented it was because it was a protocol that needed to be produced and ingested by a wide range of things. There are FPGAs in this mix. There's commodity hardware. There's real-time kernels. There's a whole range of different things that use the exact same protocol on the wire everywhere. The nice thing about this is as your requirements change, you just plug into the right switch, subscribe to the appropriate multicast group, and you can do something completely new, which really helped a lot. Orchestration, um, obviously, we all use the same basic stuff. Uh, we use Apache Mesos, um, but we use it quite light, in a quite a lightweight fashion. So we wrote our own framework for Mesos. Uh, we don't use any higher level orchestration tools. And the reason for that is that we wanted quite a lot of placement control. We were quite concerned about data locality. Obviously, for us, uh, I.O. performance is very important. Data at rest is very important. So we wanted very good control of placement. We wanted lots of fine-grained control over network resources. We wanted fine-grained control over GPUs. Uh, so we used GPUs almost exclusively. And there, a big consideration for us was making sure that we could share them when needed. We could protect them properly. Uh, so we have quite a lot of modifications to the, the Mesos slaves to, to make that happen. Um, underneath. All this, our framework itself basically gets a request to do something, and it constructs a, a directed graph from that. And uh, that graph starts off as a logical, logical graph where you estimate what resources you would like to have, and the Mesos plays the role of populating that logical graph into a physical graph where you end up with actual nodes and IP addresses and ports and all that allocation. So this is a 
hedgehog pin cushion thing on the bottom here. That's what our 32K, which is our hardest mode, basically looks like in terms of, uh, in terms of a graph. Um, Mises has been very good. Uh, it's nice and easy to use. It's, you know, it does what it says in the tin, essentially. Uh, and for us, a graph is really a bunch of containers. So the nodes are containers that do something, and then the edges are some form of data transport, be they network or IPC or whatever you want to have. Everyone seen a Mesos dashboard? Just another screenshot of another Mesos dashboard. Not very exciting. Um, that's how we feed the beast. So this is nice and small. The, you know, if you see a slide and you can't quite read it, the reason is the guy's not quite sure about the slide, or maybe there's an error in it. So you make it small so no one can actually tell. This one's actually a simulation. It's so only running four antennas. So you know, it uh, gives you a rough idea of, of kind of how we configured. So our control system effectively sends us a big JSON blob saying this is what we would like you to do. We translate that into this logical graph which has all these processing steps in it, populated physically, and then fired away on the hardware. As with everyone else on the planet, that's our basic building block, Docker container. Um, so we heard, you know, we heard earlier about inheriting from a Docker base and, and moving, up, uh, moving up the stack. So we do the same kind of thing. One thing we pay quite a lot of attention to in our Docker build process is, is pinning all our libraries. So basically, at the base level, everything is pinned. You, as a higher level user, can use an unpinned library, but you will get the pinned version if you specify an unpinned library, and that we don't have a pinned version of it underneath, it won't let you do it. So it's very much trying to make sure that the containers are always recreatable. It's all very well to get the same git hash of your code in there, but if you use a different dependency, obviously, it's balked. Um, this is all, all really about having a nice application environment uh, for people writing code at that level. So, the building blocks we build on, we have obviously the GPU support, but then there's also things quite specific to us. So there's high-speed data transports in and out. So if you need access to the high-speed data stream, that stuff's there and set up for you. There's what we call a CAT-CP device server. That's how we do our control and monitoring. That's basically a, a human-readable on-the-wire protocol we built ages ago uh, that does most of our actual control and monitoring. That lets you connect to things and, uh, and actually get poked and prodded if you need. Then there's also this thing called the telescope state. So all our containers, and that translates to being all our nodes in the graph, are stateless. So they have to be stateless, otherwise you can't use them. But they do get in a sort of a startup configuration, and they can store state in our central Redis telescope state that sits there. So this is very much around nodes can fail. They can come and go. You can kill them, start them up again. They'll pick up where they were, trying to build some uh, you know, resiliency into, this, uh, into the whole thing. Resource multiplication is part of scale. So we built this big facility. It's really expensive. It costs like a million rand a day to run if you amortize the you know, capex into the opex. We need to make best use of it as we can. And so part of what we do is we run multiple observations together and we interleave them. So this is just showing that we have this idea that things, are, things go from a controlled state to an uncontrolled state. That's the red box there. And what that's about is saying, OK, we finished this observation, but we know things are still going. So we've got some long tails on it. So like a calibration block might not finish when the telescope is finished looking at a patch of sky. It now wants to go do something else. We then tell a calibration task, right, you're free, head off, jump out the nest, burn down as you will, release resources as you go. And this is quite a helpful way to make sure that every piece of your resource puzzle is getting used uh, as much as you can. Development complexity, obviously. Yeah, this is quite a hard thing, and there's quite a lot of software in it. We cheat. We reuse as much as we can. We've heard it time and time again. There's nothing like the open source community. All of those tools and, and many, many more we use at the top line there. And really, that's about, for us, it's about writing as little code as we dare. So I just did these numbers last night, and you know, this is kind of what I would hope to see. And this is what we've tried hard to achieve. So this is the com combined commits. Python code across all our repos. So we've got something like 27 repositories in the SDP. 805,000 lines committed in total over the last nine years, 450 of those removed. So you can see I did the red-green differently. Apologies for anyone who's colorblind. But basically saying that committing lines is bad and removing them is good, uh, because in the end, we have 350k lines of active code out there, uh, which is, you know, I think that's pretty good. It's pretty modest, and that's really a reflection on the millions and millions of lines of code that sit, sit above that line. So it's preaching to the converted, uh, but it's just to show that we, we tried to do this and it actually did work quite well. And we continue to try and drive down that, uh, that complexity in the software by reducing the number of lines of code that we have there. Quality assurance is an important part of this. It's a complicated system. 
how do you know it's doing what you asked it to do? It's all very well saying, yes, tick the box. It turns on, the blinking lights come on. Does it do what our astronomers want to do? And so this is about taking bits and pieces of your system at every level and exposing them in the right way. So we talk about you know, tracing and instrumenting up your application. This is kind of tracing and instrumenting up your facility. So that's saying, I know my individual bits of code are working, but what is the quality of the data that's coming out as a whole? So we're working quite hard. This is a very much an ongoing topic about, at each stage, pulling out agreed upon metrics that people can look at and say, right, now I understand what this is doing. And even more importantly, getting those metrics in other pieces of community code. So other facilities, other people doing similar things to we're doing, if we all agree on the quality metrics, at least then we can agree, even if our code is different, that we're doing this, the same thing in the same way. Efficient user support, I mean, there's, you know, you've got to have nice, pretty tools and dashboards and displays and graphs, and we've got probably too many of these things, but uh, it's, again, there's a lot of thinking there about how do you reflect the fact that you have, say, 3,000 baselines that you want to look at at the same time. So we do things, you know, quite a lot of enveloping and quartiling and showing where things deviate from, uh, from what, what they were expected to be. Compute sizing, this is about, you know, understanding, helping our users understand where the difficulties lie because the mapping of this is our client request is, oh, we want to do more, we want to do this bigger, we want to look at a wider field of view, we want to build antennas further apart. And spending a lot of time on modeling and understanding the problem has been really useful. So what, particularly what you see out of there is where the scaling challenges really come. So, you know, if n squared type scaling, that's the kind of stuff that really hurts you. And if we can help our users understand which parts of this they can tweak, where they can back off in order to gain, uh, gain an advantage, it's really good. And then backing that up with a full model. So we worked on... Uh, modeling all the steps of particularly our imaging process, which is the dominant compute part of this. And what was very interesting was to look and see what was the difference in overall load between a short observation and a long observation. And what came out of that, which was very interesting, was the fact that a short observation can actually be harder than a long observation in some areas because of some of the steps you've got. So you've got a fixed size grid that's independent of how much data you've collected. So your FFT costs effectively start to dominate this thing if you get short and short observations. So you can, if people want to do 10 second snapshots of the sky and then don't understand why it takes two hours to reduce it. And that's because of these scaling things. And doing this modeling has been very useful to, to understand that. CI, Jenkins, et cetera, et cetera. One of the cool things we do is we actually run, we, synth we synthesize data and run it through a variety of competing packages. LW Imager is a kind of like the gold standard imaging thing. This is our internal one and we compare those and see that we're actually doing Great astronomy. So it's, it's like testing, but like at a very, very high level there. Um, optimize last, this is a good example of when we decided, right, we needed to optimize halfway through. So we found that we were nowhere near being compute bound on our GPUs. And a big reason of that was the way memory access was being done in these gridding operations. So this is the step of taking your uh, visibility data, which is not in a regularized grid, and regularizing it. And so quite a bit of work there. We got to the stage where our overall pipeline there is 55% efficient. And if you look at it in terms of the way GPU runs, it's basically completely compute bound, which is exactly where you want to be. Things like hardware deployment. When I said we had 6.7 engineers, we've got 6.7 engineers for everything. Building our own hardware, deploying our own hardware, writing code, managing it, orchestration, et cetera, et cetera. So a couple of us went up to the Karoo when our computer arrived in boxes. And we had to turn it from cardboard to, to metal to a system. Uh, again, building on the tools. So we use MAS, which is quite horrible, but they're all quite horrible. Um, the main reason MAS is horrible is because you always suspect it's just going to delete everything one day. It's sitting there kind of like malevolently lurking, and uh, it is a worry. But MAS plus Ansible meant we went from basically a box of cardboard uh, to mining. We actually did, we did legitimately mine with this thing to burn it in. Uh, it was blessed by our superiors, and somewhere in the in our offices, there's a printout of the wallet and a piece of paper sitting in someone's drawer. And like in a million years' time, someone will find it as an interesting artifact. But that was a really good exercise in this and, and you know, proving to ourselves that we had our systems right. And part of that is trust. And what I really like about focusing on especially things like Ansible and making sure you capture all your configuration properly is that you can trust your system. And so we did this step about a year ago where we absolutely blew away everything we had in production to the metal, all the machines we had in the crew. 
upgrade, and the reason we did that is we wanted to do an OS upgrade. So we did the OS upgrade, full redeployment, and was, you know, it was a day, and we were back in, back in action. And that proved that we didn't have lurking config problems, everything was checked in, Ansible's right. A lot of work goes behind that, but you know, if you get to the stage of, of trusting it to that level, it's very useful. Repeatability is, is very important. Uh, so if you do science one day, you want to make sure that the science you do the next day is the same. It's no good if your blippy Nobel Prize is actually just a blip and not a real Nobel Prize. And so being able to show and prove that what we've done is repeatable day after day is a big part of our deployment and release process. We have a staging tag, but we don't have a staging environment, really. People will be pleased to know. Um, our staging environment is effectively production, but the staging tag is what you use in production. Uh, so you... Basically, master is live, and master gets built all the time, and new containers get built from master every time there's a commit. Mostly, that's via PR. You're not really supposed to commit into master directly. Those get run and tested in, in the lab. When you think you're ready, you cut a staging tag, you go to site, you book time, you observe a known source, you see what it looked like. When you're happy with the staging tag, you cut a production tag, and anything that's science quality has to go against a production tag. The production tag has got enough information. You can go back and figure out the Git revision of, of every piece of code that was in there. You have the Docker manifest ID. You can go pull those back. So you can completely recreate your software stack um, doing there. Storage is, is as storage at scale for us was, was challenging. I won't go into too much detail, except to say that performance was an issue. Money was a bigger issue, so we built our own hardware. That's kind of a rendering of what it looks up, up there. Basically, we wanted a, a JBOD, but we wanted the drives connected directly, no port multipliers. So we worked with a, a partner of ours locally, and we developed this uh, storage appliance. That's what it looks like on the right-hand side there. That's what three tons of hard drives look like on the left-hand side here. And I call this the scale storage human problem. We didn't at all properly estimate how much time and effort it would take to unpack 3,000 hard drives from boxes and put two screws into each bloody drive and put them in these chassis. So again, it was the same 6.7 engineers sitting in there for four days screwing screws into a drive, and we never want to do that again. Next time, we're going to ask for the vendor to deliver them unboxed with screws in them. It would be amazing. Um, but yeah, so we built this uh, big Ceph deployment. So we use Ceph as our object storage software on top of uh, these storage pods. So there are 55 of these down the road at the CHPC uh, in Rosebank. That's Roughly 20 odd pibby bytes worth, or pebby bytes, I guess it is, uh, of storage. This is one of our clusters. Um, the 2.24 is what we've captured so far in like sort of six months or so of, uh, of doing stuff. The usual set of tools, just a shout out there to Console. Console is really good for service discovery. So, Console Prometheus Grafana, great stack, works nicely. Storage money again. So, we bought a tape library from IBM as a grudging purchase. And uh, we decided, bugger that, we're going to build our own tape library robotics. So you know, that thing cost us like five million bucks, which is a total waste of money. So we're building our own, and that should be finished sometime in the end of the year when we find a bit of a gap to do it. Distribution of data. So this is just a slide for people to look at afterwards. Again, we're doing a similar thing to most people doing. So our data access library, which sits out in the world and has access to our data, you go to our archive interface, you find the observation you want, you get a signed URL for that with a JWT token into it. If you open that in the data access library, thereafter all data access itself is S3, goes through our storage gateway into Ceph. Um, with carrying the token, the token gets stripped out by the proxy for your authorization. Uh, the nice thing about using that approach and using objects underneath for our data is that everything is very parallel. You load all these objects in parallel uh, from the store, so it's very fast and gives us a nice sort of secure way to do that. That's another view on some of the distribution we do, and we have you know, direct mail out of tapes as well as a, as a, as a popular way to get uh, media to people who are in far-flung places. Uh, decoupling is just about writing simulators. I'll skip that. I always end up with too many slides and talk rubbish in the early slides, and then we get rushed to the end. A quick shout-out to troubleshooting. This is kind of the last thing I want to really say, is this is the kind of troubleshooting that's, that we do, and we do it badly. So... You know, some of the talks have been very good, so jean lucas talk about how you know, some of the tracing is, is interesting. We get a ticket. Oh, there's no observation in the archive. The data's missing. What's happened? And it always comes to STP because we're the last system, so it's always our fault. So what do we do? We go and have a look in some of the logs. Right, okay, an observation actually ran. Go look at the archive. Was it user error? No, it's not actually in the archive, so they weren't lying to us for once. Hmm, okay, let's go and have a look at our dashboard. Right, were we capturing data at the time? Yes, data was coming into the STP. Great, that's not, tick that off. Go and have a look and see if we were dropping anything. Were we falling behind? Was our pipeline running out of space? Nope, that all looks good. We had plenty of free slots and we were capturing flags. 
hmm, let's go and have a look at the switches. Maybe we were dropping packets upstream of ourselves. Nope, no discards on the spine links or the client. Okay, perfect. Next stage, right, let's go and have a look at the logs. Obviously, logspout, logstash, elk, kibana, it's very standard. Go and have a look there, those logs look okay. We did actually request the metadata to be written. That's the last log, maybe something went wrong after that. Okay, go and have a look at our internal dashboard for our master controller, have a look and see that oh, one of our services is stuck in finishing and didn't actually get there. Hmm, I wonder why. Log into a machine, this is obviously this is terrible troubleshooting that I'm actually SSHing into things. Right, the data is actually there in S3. Hmm, look on Mesos, okay, it thinks the task is fine. Right, let's go and use AR cons AIO console to go and log into the task itself and see if the event loop's blocked. Nope, the event loop is fine. Hmm, conundrum. Eventually figure out what's really wrong, look at the syslogs on the box, okay, that's buggered. So you can see the block tasks on the RAID array. It's all gone quite pear-shaped. And what it ends up with is another ticket. So we discover that RAID 10 partitions that are XFS formatted on a particular kernel revision die when you start getting a resync. So it was quite, a, you know, wasn't the kind of thing we expected. But that's our kind of debug loop. Our solution, it's a blank piece of paper because we're not doing it very well. And so this is something we definitely have to work on as we, as we progress. So just to wrap up and say, in the past, in 2010, I put that as our basic building block. We just want GPUs with network cards in them. That's kind of what you can get these days. So that's a, a Tegra Xavier. That's running a 40 gig interface on it, pretty much at wire rate. Uh, you know, those are the things we're gonna use to build a lot of our next gen compute. That's one of the renders of it. So that's, you know, compute in oil. You've heard me talk about this kind of stuff before if you've ever heard me talk. And hopefully we'll have this, and it won't be another six years uh, before I come and talk about that actually working. So to finish. At the end of 2000, 2013 is when I spoke here last, and that's the slide I put up. I said what we were doing was a new dawn for African science. And that's what Professor Phil Diamond said in July 2018 about Meerkat, standing in the Northern Cape in South Africa and Africa to inaugurate what is the most powerful radio telescope in the world. And I think that's you know, a real statement of where this project has come from and where it's gone. And for all of us involved, you know, it really has been a real epic journey. This is the cover of National Geographic this month, April 2019. We're on it, so it's a global project on the global stage, and uh, we're expanding through Africa as we go. I'll see you in 2025 if my six-year cadence goes on. I've only just started, and that's it. Cool. So there'll be questions. Do you mind standing behind the lectern? And then we've sure. got two mics. Thanks. These ones. Oh, yeah. yeah. OK, cool. cool. Any questions? Yeah. So that National Graphic uh, cover said, we are not alone. Mm. Are we? Do you have proof? <laughs> I mean, that is a good question. So that article is specifically about SETI and uh, how SETI is using Meerkat. I think if you look at the volume of space and you know, the discovery volume out there, are we going to answer the question, I think, is the best way to say it. The beauty of these instruments is that we'll be able to probe so much of the nearby universe that if we find nothing there, I don't think there's anything. So 10, 15 years, we'll know. Hi. Um, it's a great project, and I think the engineering challenge you got is huge. Um, can you just give us a little bit of details when you move to the SKA, how you are going to do things like taking cross products across dishes that are thousands of kilometers away from each other. Sure, so obviously the, the, the plan for this project in the long term is to have antennas spread through Africa. So there what you do is we have actually a pretty decent abundance of fiber on both the west and the east coast. Uh, so there it's about accurately timestamping data that's local to the dishes, bringing them back to the central location where you have to have a pretty massive buffer to do a lot of time alignment because you're gonna have you know, milliseconds of latency and we're talking about hundreds of terabits a second worth of overall data rate, even those few milliseconds are gonna to start to, to cost you. So that's, that's a big challenge. Integrating these very different scene conditions as well, different sources of interference, you know, people using their cell phone you know, at the dish 100 k's away and they're not using it in this one local to you, again, do different things to the data. So all of that is, is a challenge and I guess you know, I've probably got another 20 years building radio telescopes to fix it. Um, on your fiber links, um, how often are your repeaters and what repeater technology do you use? So the, I can't talk about the SANREN portion of it, um, but the portion that we control, which is something like 100Ks, has just got one repeater. So it's 50Ks on those. They're a, 
it's 10 gigabits at the moment, it's about to go to 100 gigabits, and we expect to keep the same repeater distance there for that, that segment. Hi, thanks. That was an incredible talk. Um, you touched a little bit on uh, capturing data from 64 different satellites, the, well, um, telescopes at the same time, and cleaning that data must be an absolute mission. Uh, it almost seems prime for machine learning or some way of improving that over time, yet it wasn't mentioned. Is that something you guys are taking into consideration? Yeah, so, you know, it's a very good question. So we're, we're absolutely looking at ML-type techniques. The difficulty there is most of them are not that well suited to the level of data and the data rates we're talking about. So you know, we get multiple 100 gigabits a second um, from the correlator. It would be ideal if you had an agent that could actually look at that and inspect it and pick out these anomalies. I think what we're going to do really is you know, the, real, the real place for ML in that is training your traditional code and uh, getting proper parameters and things on, on your traditional flaggers, which are, can run at quite a high speed. And we do have a group that's just started. There's a couple of people working on that at the moment. Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, just a question on SAFE and object storage. If you can share yep. any insights and thoughts into running, running it at scale and any advice you can give in that sure. regard. So a couple of punts. SAFE is amazing. Um, we're part of the SEF Foundation. Uh, we've been using SEF for quite a long time. Like last year, we had basically the biggest SEF deployment in the world, which was a problem. We didn't want to be at that sort of level of, uh, of the sharp edge of it. It's, if you understand how it works, it's really good. Um, the tools are quite immature, some of them, but it actually does what it says under the tin, and it's very well designed. Uh, we do have a Cape Town SEF users group that started up, and we're trying to take that countrywide. So if you're interested, just drop me an email. Um, and we're you know, trying to grow the Ceph community in the country because if you want to do object storage, Ceph is awesome. Hi. Uh, I sort of have a more business, I guess, level question. I was just wondering how do clients actually schedule time? Is it sort of like salt where like universities and big organizations pay you for observing time or is it, uh, do you sort of have a, a specific portion? Because obviously the government do uh, quite a bit, so do they get something out of it? How does that work? Yeah. So it's, it, Radio Telescope is an interesting beast in that we pay all this money to build it and then we give away the time for free. Um, <clears throat> so we have a basically a time allocation committee that looks at proposals that come in and decide who gets what amount of time. There's a South African component that's needed on those proposals. So something like 60% of the time at least involves a South African uh, PI in some way or the other, so principal investigator. But uh, that uh, calls for proposal every year. Those come in and we evaluate them. And it uh, looks like I've been drinking this whiskey that's standing here. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's a sort of an ongoing thing of, of trying to allocate time. Time is you know, scarce and expensive on this thing. But uh, we're heavily oversubscribed, and that's a good thing, I guess. 